may not be the final frontier in space, but it is a new one. The United States Military Space Command Center is just up and running. And that's made us here wonder if it's simple common sense or a prelude to Star Wars. Welcome to Roundtable. Hello from me, David Foster. The United States has said that now there's a Space Command Centre in the military, a Space Force will follow. So we are here to discuss what that means and whether with Russia and China are also apparently making military advances beyond our planet, the scene is set for an extremely cold war indeed. <laughs> Space is about science, discovery, and perhaps more than ever before, it's about power. US President Donald Trump has launched a new Pentagon command solely focused on warfare in space. This is a landmark day, one that recognizes the centrality of space to America's national security and defense. China and Russia are also advancing their space capabilities. As technology improves, there is concern about the future of space and how to protect satellites for communication, cybersecurity and surveillance. But what exactly will a Space Warfare Command look like? Air Force General John Raymond, who will lead the new command, has said, I'm convinced that space is a warfighting domain. I'm convinced that our way of life and our way of war depend on space capabilities. Will space be a new front line? And should we be worried about a real-life Star Wars? Time to get talking with me at the round table. We have Alexandra Stickings, who researches space policy and security for the defence think tank, Rusi. Robert Fox, defence editor of London's Standard newspaper. And on the line from Atlanta, on the left, you see there Professor Laurie Blank, an expert in space law at Emory University, Atlanta, and Rachana Reddy, space engineer with European Space Industries. And we'll come to you two overseas from the UK at the moment in, in just a moment. But, Bob Alexander, let me ask you, first of all, this has been done, perhaps, because the United States is very worried about the competition, if you like. It's fallen far behind. Well, it's been done with classic trumpery, which got a bit of bad publicity when it was first mooted, although, as you say, it was officially launched by Vice President Pence on the 29th of August. And uh, it had shades of the great Frank Hampson cartoon, Dan Dare, uh, Pilot of the Future. And there was a lot of cultural resistance within the service community. And this is serious because was this really saying that you no longer respected people like John Glenn and Chuck Yeager, the right stuff in the famous Tom Wolfe book? And hitherto, the services had said, well, we can really manage this uh, uh, ourselves. Mind you, it's not a start, Aborigine, from birth of the space agency. One had been started in 1985. Now, the question we're all going to be discussing, why has it been regenerated now? And typical with Trump in terms of the mm. political uh, fanfare and trumpery, there's a lot of sense and there's a lot of nonsense. And, and, and is it that... because the United States is worried about where other countries, uh, principally, let us say, China and Russia, are themselves in this space race? Look, there's that. There are two things. This is binary. One is, yes, there is the progress of the others and the rivals, and not just uh, China and Russia. We'll be hearing about India. We'll be, be, be hearing about the uh, European space endeavour and, indeed, attempts uh, now uh, in, in, in parts of Latin America that are, really, are getting really interested in it. But there is a date coming up, circa 2024, when militaries hit peak metal that the kind of way that they're arming themselves at the moment with tanks, however sophisticated, with I-star targeting systems, with C2 command and control and C4, it only gets you so far. So much of it is going to be run by communication and it, uh, above the stratosphere, it's going to be run in space. And this is where the United States and the NATO alliance are getting very, very worried indeed, so it makes sense. So th this leads me to a very obvious question, if you're an expert in it, as you are. This is not weaponry necessarily from space coming down to the Earth. It's weaponry from below disrupting 
what is already in space, be that telecommunications and other devices? Yes, I think, I mean, as has been mentioned, uh, this is not the first iteration of US Space Command. So space has been a militarised environment for decades now. And it is uh, partly, as I said, as mentioned again, part of the, the Trump rhetoric, you know, the US must lead in space again, doesn't quite recognise the fact that they are and have been the leaders in space. But space is increasingly important for all military operations and satellites are very vulnerable. So it's about protecting the satellites and ensuring that the countries that are developing what we call counter space capabilities are either not able to use them or that you can respond to any acts of aggression. So, so to be absolutely clear, this is, this is not a battery of rocket firing or, or laser firing devices in space aimed at the Earth. It is the other way round. Mostly, yes. So we have uh, what are called kinetic anti-satellite weapons, and these are ground-launched missiles which can destroy a satellite in orbit. We have seen both China and India test these in recent years. We're also looking at... We're seeing the development of what we call non-kinetic capabilities. So the ability to disable or disrupt a satellite without destroying it, and therefore you're denying your adversaries the information that's coming from space that's supporting... Let, let's go, let's go to, to Roshana, because you, you mentioned the anti-satellite test. I think India had one earlier this year. It's planning something perhaps for, for, for next month. How advanced is India in, in all of this? Um... Well, anti-satellite uh, weapons have been proved, yes, by four countries so far. And it's, um, as they've already proved it, it's quite easy. In fact, uh, I would say every satellite that is maneuverable, that is already in space, is a potential weapon, right? Any satellite can be maneuvered to hit another a space asset, a critical space asset of another country. So um, it is alarming, yes, not only by uh, countries which already possess the capability of uh, ASAT capability, the anti-satellite weapon capability, but also any country that has a satellite, active satellite in space. So uh, the threat is there, yes. Laurie, let me come to you and talk about some space law here. There's a treaty on the principles governing the activities, etc., etc., uh, in the exploration and use of outer space. And it has some uh, bullet points here, one of which is, this is a United Nations Outer Space Treaty, states shall not place nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction in orbit or on celestial bodies or station them in outer space in any other manner. Is that about to happen? I is that convention about to be broken? I don't think so. Um, I think there's a shared concern around the world about nuclear weapons, which we've seen... Um, I think the bigger challenge with space right now, especially in terms of the law, is trying to find shared understandings, trying to uh, get a grasp of appropriate expectations for what different states are going to do. And so it may not be weapons of mass destruction that are at the immediate sort of tip of the spear of concerns in with respect mm -hmm. to outer space, but it's many other considerations, the ASATs, the use of satellites to, uh, dis, you know, to maneuver and perhaps mm. uh, capture, crash into, disable. One of the real um, issues in terms of the law is making sure that we think through how it applies, the interpretations, and uh, try to find a place for shared understandings and expectations. What are Russia and China and India actually up to here, Robert, that, that, you're, that America might be particularly concerned about? Well, I think that we're in the shadow of the 20th century, and what the game isn't at the moment, and you even look at the manoeuvring of China, it's not about global hegemony, being a global superpower, which was the expression on the lips, more or less, uh, San Francisco, 1945, coming through to the beginning of the UN. They are protecting their space in every sense, and they are pursuing a particular vision of their self-interest. You could say the way that Russia, for example, goes about it by a, a methodology of, of disruption is extremely concerning. And I was just thinking of what uh, Laurie has just been saying to us. What she has been describing to us has, is very analogous to what was attempted with more or less success, but it's still not a closed book, with the Antarctic Treaty of um, 1958, the geo 
physical year. The idea was Antarctica was going to be a heritage site for everybody, not to be exploited uh, for minerals or whatever, and guess what's going on there, nor to be militarized, nor to be nuclearized. And there's been questions about a civil nuclear reactor on the base at, uh, at Rothera. That gives you a particularity. But what she raises, and it just must be running through all our heads and the audience when we, she says that, enforcement. How on earth are you going to monitor, inspect, and in, enforce a regulation um, of, of, of the militarization of space? Because I go back to my point about peak heavy metal, is the thing flips over in the mid 2020s, because there are things that you're going to be able to do to, from space and see from space, which opens whole new questions. Nuclear balance at the moment, for example, is based on the idea that the seas aren't transparent and you can put deep submarine boomers with uh, strategic nuclear weapons there. Is that going to be there forever? And this is why the command of space or being effective in space or being able to retaliate or oppose in space is very, is very, very important. But what I think, and I want to raise this thing, the website for the new Space Command, the website for the new British Space Command entity, says the square root of almost zero. A lot of aspirations. Either they know things that they don't want to tell us, or I think they're faced with horrific budgets. You see, when it comes to enforcement, which we were talking about here. One of the things I was going to say to, to, to Laurie was um, she mentioned weapons of mass disruption. I know there's a legal definition of what is a weapon of mass disruption, but if it destroys financial institutions on Earth, then a laser stationed in space controlled by whoever could be deemed to be a weapon of, of mass destruction. And it's impossible to police this, isn't it? Well, it is. And the, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, you know, was in 1967, and things have moved on so much since then. So what it does, it, it's a, it, it creates a very big grey area, which in a way actually suits space actors because it allows them to do and behave in, in a certain way. Um, the difficulties we see now, of course, with the, the capabilities that were not you know, even realised when the Outer Space Treaty came into force. As you mentioned, financial institutions are reliant on global navigation satellite systems like GPS. So if there was a way to, to disrupt or turn off GPS, you, you could cause huge damage to societies. Um, so the language is very difficult, but what you see now in the multilateral discussions around the weaponization of space, it's very, very difficult to, to come to any consensus, mm. and there is no enforcement uh, available. What you see happening are voluntary guidelines and the move towards creating, you know, recognized and agreed norms of behavior um, that, that keep that, that balance in space without, uh, you know, hoping to prevent any sort of tipping... But the idea of norms of behaviour in an alien world, if you like, out of space, um, begs the question of what are those, those normalities? I want to read something that the guy in charge of this new um, military command says, Air Force General John Raymond. He says, I'm convinced that space is a war-fighting domain. Our way of life and our way of war depend on space capabilities. Well, he's just it, justifying it, but he actually says... Uh, convinced that space is a war-fighting domain. That is definitely uh, become quite a popular phrase now. You, you see it happening with most countries. I think even NATO is looking at declaring it to be a war-fighting domain. But, of course, that starts to bring into question all, you know, what do we mean by conflict in space? Um, and space actually... It's whatever is... you want it to mean, isn't it? It could be. And space really is an enabler. It's, it's enabling operations in the terrestrial domains through the information that it provides. And as soon as you start to bring in those ideas about war fighting, you have to start thinking about what does retaliation look like? If a satellite is targeted by one state, how does that other state respond? Is it in space? Is it you know, in the sea, in the maritime domain, in the land domain? And what does that mean for broader concepts of escalation? Laurie, what do you reckon when it comes to space law? And you can talk about anything you want. Um, I noticed that you said to one of our producers, this is not an aggressive move. But in what sense is it not aggressive? Is it not a form of sort of the, the old mad philosophy, the mutually assured destruction? In other words, we're not going to do it, but we have to have something up there to make sure that you don't do it, because if you do it, we'll blow you up and therefore nobody ever does anything. Well, if we're talking about the formation of space command, um, I think politics aside, um, whether there's a desire for 
uh, show or other uh, political purposes involved. From a purely organizational and structural standpoint, this is about uh, efficiency of capabilities. It's about organizational structure. And the U.S. has a number of combatant commands. Um, most of them are regional. A number of them are functional. We have Cyber Command that was designed to coalesce and organize uh, U.S. capabilities within the military with respect to cyber. And the same thing... But can, can I ask you, sorry, sorry to, to butt in yeah. a little bit, can I ask you where you think it's going from here? I understand it is just um, a, a section of the military whose job it is to make sure that this um, is kept on top of. But where does it go from here when we have the guy in charge saying the space is a warfighting domain? Well, I don't think it's a question of going somewhere. I think that space has been used in war for decades now. At a minimum, we can look back to the 1991 Persian Gulf War um, as, it, as a clear starting point for a robust use of space capabilities in warfare. And so to say, certainly from a U.S. perspective, to say that the space is a domain of military operations, which is a, another way to say a warfighting domain that perhaps sounds less martial, um, I don't think it's a new statement. I think it's a factual, objective statement of reality. Every time you use any reconnaissance capability in today's world, you're using space. Anytime you target based on that reconnaissance capability, you're using space. Anytime and, and, you use... Uh, Laura, Laura, and I, I know uh, Robert wants to come in. Can yeah. I make two points? You're course, absolutely Ned, right. Ned Rachana, I'll come to you in just a minute. I was there with the US and the UK and Arab tanks uh, going into Iraq in 91. And for three hours, the GP... You're absolutely right, Laurie. The three, for three hours, the GPS went down and everything had to stop because it was too complex. There were nearly a quarter of a million troops uh, uh, on the move at that time. Interestingly, the only major armed force... Correct me, ladies and gentlemen, if I'm wrong, that manoeuvres and trains at night without the aid of GPS is the PLA, the People's Liberation Army uh, of China. You're absolutely right. And I was just thinking, uh, Laurie particularly, that actually the US cannot prosecute its Africa command without the use of space agencies and satellites, communications, and above all, surveillance. It's what, rather vulgarly, we call, it's not ungoverned space, which is what te technical geopoliticians like Alex would, would call it. It is what a friend of mine, Lucio Caracciolo, a great geopolitician, said, is the chaos area. And looking into chaotic areas of huge movements of people, you're absolute... It, it, this agency is a requirement. But I think, contrary to what the good commander, the good Brigadier General, was saying, it's actually an enabler. What the command... I think if I've got it right, it brings in the other major commands, and it's spelled out in the stand-up ceremony there. It works with the Navy, Marines, Army and Air Force, and it has to. C can I come to you in just a moment? Because I know you probably want to say something about this, but I feel we've left Roshana on our own yeah, uh, for a little while. Well, she knows how it works. <laughs> in, in, in terms of... I, I put it to, to Laurie, what comes next? Um, the same question is, is directed at you because you're on the practical end of things. So, um, firstly, I don't really believe that, uh, you know, it's, there's going to be a Star Wars kind of scenario where all the countries are trying to shoot each other's space assets because it's going to be uh, a lose-lose game scenario for everybody, because everybody is sharing the same space, which is the outer space. Um, so firstly, I don't think there's going to be a Star Wars kind of a scenario, at least by sane uh, countries, which I hope most of us are. Um, and secondly, I think there is a lot of dependence. Uh, as you said, the definition itself of, of a weapon of mass destruction is changing now because of the dependence because of how intricately the economies of countries are tied into uh, or are tied with space assets. Another point, which is basically, um, I'd write, like to draw parallels uh, to the nuclear weapons, right? Mm. Because nobody really wants to fire, uh, fire a nuclear weapon at another country because it's, well, it's, uh, it's, it's bad. It's not only bad for the other country because it destroys the natural resources that we all share. So the biggest deterrent for nuclear... Uh, against another country firing a nuclear weapon at uh, at your own country is demonstrating the capability of having a nuclear weapon. So exactly... Uh, as we said, the mutually assured destruction philosophy. Exactly. Alexandria, yeah. 
Um, just in terms of that, that thinking about uh, the, the MAB philosophy, I mean, the kinetic ASATs, the problem we have with them is they create space debris. They create additional debris, mm. which is a this huge problem. This is blowing problem. up a satellite in space. Blowing up a satellite in space creates a massive amount of debris, and debris is a huge problem for the security of all satellites in orbit. Uh, the Chinese test, which was at over 800 kilometers, the debris is still up there. Mm. Um, we're tracking thousands of pieces of it, and it will be there for a very long time. The Indian ASAT test earlier this year uh, was carried out at 282 kilometers, and, and it was made, made out to be much more responsible because it was so much lower. But some debris from that test has been detected at much higher altitudes. And all it takes is something the size of a pinhead to, to, to cause an awful lot of damage travelling at that well, speed. Well, we, we, we did see a paint fleck cause damage uh, to, uh, to the space shuttle. I think you raised a very important point about MAD and nuclear retaliation, which was raised by Rochana too. I think it's one of the reasons that John Bolton went, actually. Because when they talk, we should about point out he is the the, the, the recently late departed national security, security advisor, uh, much revered yeah. by by people on, should I say, very well over on the right side of yeah. the spectrum. But Bolton used to, until quite recently, talk about well, if you could have a cyber attack which could take out the grid, and silence and produce something like on a grand scale like the Great North American Ice Storm of '98 across the whole of the east, eastern seaboard of the US, which was one war game exercise they did. What was his answer for a response? Just nuke them. And that is absolutely a negative and a negative in precisely the way that, much better than I, that Roshana has described. And this is old thinking, and it's what Alex and the panel are talking about, is actually there has to be a new a new rebalancing of strategic and, and, thinking and, and, about And what about it? Yeah. law when it comes to a rebalancing, Laurie? The first point is when we talk about weapons of mass destruction in general from the law's standpoint in terms of when things are prohibited or not prohibited in stationing in outer space, we're talking about nuclear weapons, biological chemical weapons. That's the general understanding of weapons of mass destruction. So activities or operations that might produce a result that feels like mass destruction um, would nonetheless not be covered. So a massive cyber operation would not be covered by that particular uh, prohibition. However, what the real challenge is right now, now and going forward with respect to the law, is understanding how the law applies to activities that are new, that are hard to understand, whose results are hard to see, so when we think about the way the law understands threat and attack and the right of a state to respond in self-defense and intervention and things like that, that law has developed over time with respect to the terrestrial environment and the kinetic... Can, can I ask you this? Um, I, I read that there was um, a convention on the, the fact that you cannot militarise the moon but no restriction on military activity in space, just these vaguely suggested, um, you know best behaviour rules. Is anybody working on something that could actually be enforceable? Well, there is law. There's quite a lot of law. The question is um, both exactly how does it apply and um, what are the situations in which a state or the international community can effectively enforce it. And so, for example, uh, there, are, there are two projects going on right now. I'm involved in one of them. Uh, called the Woomera Manual on the International Law Applicable to Military Space Operations. And what we're doing is literally putting together the existing international law in clear statements of rules and explanatory commentary that applies to all situations of military uses of outer space. Okay. So uh, that uh, when a state is trying to understand what its uh, rights are, what its privileges are, what its duties are, what the parameters for response how to understand whether something is an attack, when it could respond in self-defense, uh, what is a lawful target, any range of different questions. Um, the goal is to think through these things in advance rather than in a moment of panic when something happens. Sure. What is to prevent a Star Wars war up in space, other than the fact that it might hurt you down below? But if you think it's not, why not? For those who would maybe believe that they wouldn't be affected by it. There isn't. But, but that would be a, a very, very small number of people or groups. 
because everyone would be affected. I think what is keeping it in balance and which will continue to keep it in balance is the reliance on space and the recognition that it is a very, very you know, insecure environment with a very a unique set of challenges that any action which would cause you know, a, a, an increase in debris or, or potential retaliation would affect the ability to continue to use it. OK, I, I, th this observer isn't necessarily convinced by that argument. Robert Fox, you mentioned Antarctica at the beginning. When it comes to self-interest, countries act in their own self-interest. Laurie, thank you very much indeed. Rachana, appreciate your time. Robert Fox in the studio, Alexandra Stickings, thank you very much indeed. Um, they are, they say at the moment, these international uh, actors, just trying to do it to prevent further catastrophe, to stop things getting out of hand out there. We shall see. From me, David Foster, from the Roundtable team, from my guests, thank you for watching. Hope to have your company next time. Goodbye.